Hi there, this is Don Ross, and welcome to Guitar Case. Guitar Case is a podcast dedicated to anything to do with the guitar. The instruments themselves, the people that play them, the people that make them, people who write music for them, anything to do with the guitar. So it's been a long time since episode two. Yet again, I've had a long gap between episodes. I apologize. Um, it's been a crazy time since I graduated from my orchestration degree in the spring of 2021. Work started coming in at such a furious pace, and of course, being self-employed and an artist, when people offer you work, it's pretty hard to say no. So I kept saying yes, and I kept being very, very busy. I ended up scoring several films and a documentary series and creating lots of music for a bunch of different music libraries and mixing and mastering recordings, writing new music for video games, all kinds of stuff. So it's been a great, crazy time, and all my studio time has been eaten up by that. But I finally have a slight gap between projects right now, so I can get a couple more episodes out there into the air. So on the same day, I'm going to be uploading both episodes three and four, which will be parts three and four of my interview with Rob Poland. Rob is the founder and owner of Candy Rat Records based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He runs the label with his wife, Holly. And the label was founded in 2005 as an internet-based label in the wake of how Napster had completely changed the record industry. And in the years since, Rob has created probably the most important guitar-centric label ever. <laughs> and uh, over the course of those years, he has seen the rise and fall and rise again of acoustic music and the various shifts and turns that the internet has forced upon his business model and the business model of his artists. Anyway, so we had a long chat about that at the Fingerstyle Collective Festival in Arkansas in 2019. We talked for hours, and so that's taken up the first several episodes of Guitar Case. So here's part three, where we talk about the era right after the giant juggernaut that was <laughs> drifting, Andy McKee's tune that took off on YouTube in late 2006 and led to enormous popularity, not only for Andy, but for all the artists on the label. Uh, we're going to talk about the era right after that, that led to the signing of artists like Antoine Zufour and Ewan Dobson. And we'll pick up in episode four where we leave off here. So enjoy this part three of my chat with Rob Poland of Candy Rat Records. So the reason that I think that YouTube thing kind of got a little weird as far as like my perspective, your perspective, is at the end of the first year of the business, um, like with $30,000 in sales and without taking any income out that year, I realized it wasn't going to be a business. It, it was going to be a hobby. Um, and things weren't going great. You know, the original contract that we had, had set up had that uh, three-year exit clause type thing, which is, you know, if things weren't going great, then you could, you could pull, your contra uh, pull your record off, back off. You, the artist would own it again. But there was a financial penalty to that if things were, and I, the financial penalty was that if things were going good, um, then you were going to make a lower, lower royalty rate. And I only ever signed, I, only, I took that clause out of the contract after the first year because I realized it, it, it really shouldn't have been there. But, um, but at the, you know, I, after putting a lot of money in and, you know, a lot of, you know, you kind of try to shift gears in your career and start a new business and you emotionally invest in it. And things weren't going well, and I remember getting the call from you kind of that summer, which is like, I think I want to, I think I want to be independent um, and, and pull my record back. And I'm like, well, okay, um, but that's three years, you know, that's at the end of the three-year period. It's not after nine months. Right. Um, and then YouTube was happening at the same time, and I felt like I had, I had to kind of battle to, to establish, to just, you know, even to get, to, to, to you know, explain, just to give it a shot. You know, so, so that was my perspective, and, and I remember like, like shifting gears and like, okay, Don wants to go independent now. So Andy, I think you're my next most strongest artist. I remember mm -hmm. a conversation with Andy and saying, okay, I'm going to shift like the majority of my funding left towards trying to get your career going, and mm -hmm. here's here's what I'll do. Um, 
that was that same time that was around this all happened within a month around that tour that we had with like uh, Don and Michael Man, uh, Mac, Michael Mannering and mm -hmm. Andy and um, and then the, fortunately we had that good timing with YouTube and mm -hmm. and uh, it's just drifting blew up so yeah. so the business changed and I think everybody got a little bit more comfortable with okay you know sure. Rob Rob might know what he's doing <laughs> Um, you know, let, let's kind of stick around and give them a little bit of time to get this thing going. Mm -hmm. um, so, but like with any business, the first first year of developing anything new can always be uh, emotionally draining, uh, For sure. financially draining. For sure. And, and just a struggle. I mean, 90% of businesses fail within the first year. And I think, you know, especially <clears throat> in light of the, the whole Napster reality and everything else, everybody was just flailing their arms. Nobody really knew what they could really do that would feel somehow secure, somehow like a little bit more sure. Not that there's never anything like a sure thing, but just, you know, like even I got cold feet and um, I was really wondering, okay, well, maybe I, maybe, maybe it's just silly to do this, you know? And, and uh, so, but fortunately, yeah, once, once I saw that things were going well on YouTube, I thought, okay, well, this could change the game a lot. Right. And it certainly did. And it made it, you know, here all these years later, you know, 14 years later, and I'm still associated with the label. So you know, right, it's obviously right. made sense. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm, I, I owe so much, you know, to, to you. I mean, this, this label wouldn't have been created without, without you. Right, right. Period. <laughs> okay, well, that's very nice to hear, but thank you. And, yeah, the interesting thing is that... Um, it's happened many times over the years that even artists who eventually, you know, put records out with the label and stuff like that, a lot of them were under the impression that you and I were actually business partners, which we were, never were. Like, right? you know, I was your first artist who got signed to the label, and I've never had any share in what's gone on with other artists at all. Um, but it's funny that was a misconception a lot of people had, and uh, mm -hmm. even people would sometimes introduce me as saying I was one of the creators of Candy Rat, and I would say, well, no, 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 no. I mean, I was there when the idea came up, but I was an artist needing a way to market my recordings. Uh, I left that to Rob. It was really Rob's thing, you know? So anyway, just this podcast episode should help dispel those myths that <laughs> I've, never, I've never been a financial partner or a business partner. I've just been one of your artists. But uh, obviously, it was the first one, and, uh, and suggested one or two people to you along the, raid, along the road that worked out okay. The most important one, and, and, and the re really the reason the label exists. I mean, it's just I probably most ideas start with you know, uh, or most businesses start with an idea, and and uh, and my idea was was you know again uh, the music you were making was amazing music, and and again the, what you were doing with fingerstyle was revolutionary and. Even when I found out more about fingerstyle and I started looking back at the Narada period and the Wyndham Hill period and I started studying those, you know, like, like the ups and downs of those labels. Mm -hmm. and, and there was, there was probably like, if you talk to John Stropes from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, who's been at this uh, since the 70s in fin and really just dedicated his entire life to, to fingerstyle and you know, there was Kodki before that, and John Fahey, and, mm -hmm. and even before those guys, there were blues, American blues guitarists that were doing fingerstyle. So yeah. fingerstyle Country has, blues has a stuff, long yeah. history um, of, of, of developing and, and, uh, and innovation in you know, different periods of time. Just as an aside, John Stropes that Rob just mentioned is an educator. Uh, he works at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, and Back in the 80s, I believe, he started the first university program in fingerstyle guitar, which I think uh, at various times has stopped and started again. Um, and I've been a guest there once to do uh, a, a concert and a workshop, and also we did that recording there for the DVD. Um, John, yeah, he's been an amazing person in terms of being able to um, sort of find the academic angle to what's going on because I mean fingerstyle guitar as a technique is very developed it's like classical guitar because it's a relatively new idea in terms of it being a, a North American phenomenon for the most part played on steel strings for the most part so unlike classical music which is played on nylon string guitars and classical guitar is sort of dependent on repertoire most of which was written a while ago uh, previous centuries mostly 
Uh, so fingerstyle guitar is what came to be the name for finger picking. Finger picking was definitely what it was called when I was a kid. Fingerstyle is a term I think that sort of got coined more in the 80s and to the 90s. And so when I was a kid, um, I was hearing people like Joni Mitchell and Bruce Coburn, and I was hearing folk players like Arlo Guthrie and stuff like that doing uh, rhythmic picking. But I mean, Joni Mitchell and, and Bruce Coburn were doing something at a much higher level that I definitely aspired to. Um, and so they were early influences on me. But of course, on the American side of things, you know, I, I was in Canada and I was in French Canada, so I was relatively insular in terms of what I was exposed to. Um, but I got to hear a lot of the, the cool things that were happening in the Canadian scene. Um, I was really ignorant about people like uh, Chad Atkins and Jerry Reed and that whole Nashville thing. I didn't find out about that until I was well into adulthood. Um, but the good thing is that um, I, don't, I don't really have affinity for that style of music anyway, so it wouldn't have uh, had much of an effect on me, I don't think, because I, I wouldn't have wanted to play that style. As much respect as I have, of course, for those players and, and their contribution to the whole world of music. But um, so that's one of the things that made my style a bit wonky. And, and maybe that's a good thing because it stuck out. And I think that people like uh, Preston Reed and people like, and people who are influenced by people like, like Preston and Billy and me, like Andy and, and others, have tried to um, express themselves in a different way and not quite so straight four four kind of up the middle, you know, country based kind of stuff. But that stuff's really important. And John Stropes uh, is a really great person for knowing, having an encyclopedic knowledge <laughs> of every movement that's ever happened. And of course, John has done amazing things. I want to interview him for this podcast eventually. But uh, he's done amazing things like when Michael Hedges was still alive. Of course, for those who don't know who Michael Hedges was, he was a great innovator in modern guitar playing. And uh, he tr died tragically in a car accident in 1997. I got to be a, a, a friend of his for the last 10 years of his life. And we had already, we'd always um, planned to record a duet, uh, which almost happened. I finished the piece just as he passed away. And my piece called Michael, Michael, Michael was dedicated to him. And that was supposed to be a guitar duet originally. Um, John sat with Michael at one point. I remember when this was all happening because Michael and I had started talking about the duet idea. And I found out that Michael was in Milwaukee. I found out what number to get him at at John's place. And John was in the middle of doing these exhaustive <clears throat> transcriptions of Michael's music based on like a hundred hours or whatever of video that he took from multiple angles. And if you've ever seen the transcriptions that John did of Michael's music, there's nothing like them. They're absolutely incredibly detailed. And of course, Michael was obsessive about things like how long a string would ring. And so he would actually um, use rest strokes on his right hand to stop strings at various times instead of just letting them ring. Yeah, and exactly. Is that the rest stroke? Rest stroke is with the move? fingertip. You okay. just sort of touch he the string. He stop the strings with the finger. Exactly. Exactly when he wanted to. Yeah. So John had this whole series of um, the system of using colors on the transcriptions to show how long string should ring and that kind of thing. So it's it's pretty over the top. I mean, it's it's more detail than I think most people could ever even really handle. But if you wanted to play the tunes 100% exactly replicating what Michael did, you could do it. And as a as a document, as a sort of a historical document, it's fascinating that that exists because there's very little detail like that that's ever gone into transcribing anything. Um, there are transcriptions, of course, that are of piano music that are based directly on what Beethoven played or what Debussy played or whatever, but we have no actual recordings of them playing. The, almost the, the first thing that came along was piano rolls, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, and finally you could actually get players, you know, great players, um, sitting down to a piano and you could actually get these accurate recordings yeah i mean they were they were as accurate as you could get with a binary system which is what the you know is either loud or soft on those piano rolls but still it was the actual player who created them anyway that's a, a, a fascinating aside about john stropes who's a definitely important <clears throat> person very important in personage this, in this genre or in this world in this technique yeah exactly exactly so let's move ahead so we've sort of dealt with the explosion of andy, andy mckee on the the label uh, happened around 2006, 2007. Andy eventually did do a follow-up record, I think called Gates of Nomeria. And um, he also did a, a DVD with Antoine Dufour uh, at one point. And uh, then Andy decided to go on his own with a, a, well, a different, before different that, label. Yeah, oh. before that, you guys did the joint record. Oh, that's right. We did a record pretty, together, yeah, of course. That's a pretty important record. That's a really well. important record. I, I, forgot, I forgot to mention that. Thank you for reminding me. 
Yeah, Andy and I, um, of course, had been friends at this point for several years. And um, right around the time that he his success started, we started saying, well, we should really make a record together. Because, I mean, Andy always, he very kindly uh, cites me as one of his four big influences on the instrument. So um, for him, it was like, yeah, let's do that. It would be fun. So uh, I had him come up and do, I think I had him come up and do my guitar weekend. And then he was sticking around to play at the guitar festival, something like that. It was there in the summer, I remember that. And my studio at that point, uh, I was living in a little town called Cannington, and um, I had a studio in my outbuilding. It was like a, a two-car garage, and half of it was finished and heated. So I used it as a recording studio. And I had it set up full-time with mics everywhere, a set of drums with, that were always mic'd, and a bass sitting there waiting to be played, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Andy and I uh, worked out a few arrangements of uh, tunes, to play his duets. So Andy knew a lot how to play a lot of my tunes already. So what we did was we we did some arrangements of my tunes with, with him playing the original part and then me coming up with a second part as an arrangement, either like on a, a guitar capoed up or a guitar, you know, baritone guitar or something, something to, to fill out the arrangement. And then uh, uh, we did uh, some duets. Actually, we worked out, we, we spent all day one day working out one arrangement, this tune, this incredibly complex tune called Spirit of the West, it was written by a guy named Russ Ferrante, who is the keyboard player in a band called the Yellow Jackets. And uh, it's, it's a phenomenally complex piece of music. It doesn't start in a complex way. It's, it's very simple at the beginning. But then it takes all these twists and turns. And it was a tune that I had been trying to figure out off the record for years. And it's just as good as my ear, I think, is. There were just like so many weird changes. Like, what is happening there? And then after a lot of searching, I finally found a record, uh, a book online, a big a jazz fake book, a new one, that had that tune in it. And it was really accurate. So I was really pleased. So I, I learned all the changes. And then Andy separately worked on a part uh, that involved some t two-handed playing, some tapping t for bass lines and, and um, some tap notes in the right hand to do the opening groove. And then uh, we took solos and stuff. Anyway, it worked out really well. <laughs> so it's a wonderful tune. It's a wonderful, I guess, arrangement. Yeah, of, the, of, yeah. The, of that tune. It's, it's a beautiful tune. It's a beautiful tune. Yeah. So that's the the first cut on the album. We also did an arrangement of a beautiful tune by um, Daryl Anger and Mike Marshall called "Dolphins." That was another big hit off the record. And then, of course, we did some duets of my tunes, some duets of Andy's tunes, and we each took a solo tune or two. And uh, it's a really nice record, and uh, you know I was really happy with the way the recording turned out from the studio. And um, yeah, that's been a very important record. A lot of people look to that as one of the better collaborative records that's been made on the instrument, and uh, it continues to sell. I know, and um, yeah. So whenever I bring it to a show, people say, "Oh, thank goodness you got that record. I love that album." You know, so it's it's nice to hear. Andy eventually decides to branch off and, uh, I can, and I can, record with somebody else. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So, all right. So, the kind of the next period of Candy Rat, um, after Andy did the two records, the uh, record and the third record with Don, and then the DVD, he got uh, his business was growing. He was touring more. He was becoming more and more, I guess, famous. More and more fan, uh, larger fan base. You know, he gets he was able to get uh, a manager and then a booking agency, and his his career really started to take off after that. Um, and uh, I think his manager had really big plans for him to, to uh, you know, go from kind of a guitar label to, I guess, mainstream was mm -hmm. the goal. Take over the world. Take over the world. And uh, that's kind of the end of Andy's story with with Candy Candy Rat. Mm -hmm. I mean, to this it's to this day, it's the most important story. Sure. But that's the last time we worked with Andy was I think in 2008. And of course, Andy and I are still really good friends, and it's been interesting to see the trajectory of what's happened for him because. Um, he and I talk regularly, and uh, he he did a record for another label, and then he's put out a live album since. But his output's been very, very quiet. Um, part of it is that he feels that you know he's been touring so much that he ha doesn't have a whole lot of time to write, and also uh, he knows that the the way that the business is going, it's it's like um, getting the mojo together to make another record when you you're not sure if it's even going to sell. Uh, it's really difficult to uh, get that up and uh, and stick to it but uh, you know he has a young family and everything else and so a whole lot of things changed for him and 
I mean, he can tour from now until Kingdom Come based on three or four recordings and he'll be fine, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> it's like Katie Lang says, you can, you can tour three records for your entire career if you want. <laughs> I, on the other hand, have taken the other tack and I've got like 18 albums out at this point. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, but again, I too have found it a little more difficult to sort of uh, uh, get myself out of bed and, and, and write more music because it, because it does get harder and harder to, to sell it. It's, it's, a, it's a big disincentive um, if you feel like you're not going to make a lot of money doing it. So I understand. All right, so we, we go from the, the Andy McKee era. Yeah, of, of I think the next important event in the evolution of Candy Rat as a record label is really Antoine DeVore. Yes. And, and in 2008, Antoine DeVore released Existence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember... Yeah, I was on the treadmill in my basement, and uh, I had loaded the uh, demo he sent to me, or I guess you know, Existence, which was the first cut of it. And I was I was just walking, doing exercise, and listening to that that record. And um, immediately, I mean, I just remember smiling a lot, and just you know, it was great music. And to me, it was the first fingerstyle record that was a complete statement of I am progressive progressive rock like technical rock driven mm -hmm. and you know existence um is is just is an important record i i feel like a lot of people feel like it's antoine dufour's favorite record mm -hmm. uh their favorite record of, of his and i was i really feel like existence was the start of antoine dufour's kind of rise to to a, an important role uh, of finger style in the finger style genre because he's not only a, a composer and performer but he's also a, a recording engineer yeah uh, he's recording a whole lot of artists these days a, whole, a lot of people who either record for candy rat or they're doing their own record and so he's become well known as a technician as well yeah and i, th I think i think the, the 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 thought out there is that no one is is making a, is recording acoustic guitar and making it sound better than than he is mm -hmm. Um, and he's really making the acoustic guitar sound bigger than the you know the bigger than life. It's almost uh, uh, I don't know. It, he just he's done a very good job, and he's probably the top I guess engineer producer in the acoustic guitar mm -hmm. yeah, recordings a lot of for the last few years here. A lot of people are making the beeline, buying plane tickets to go to Montreal yeah. to work with him. Yeah, going for sure. to a little town in Quebec to yeah, record right. their to record their next record. So. So Existence came out, and that was probably the peak of what I would call the first stage of Candy Rat. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when Art Emotion was out, uh, Music for Vacuuming was out, the thing that came from somewhere, which was the duet uh, album between Andy and Don Ross, mm -hmm. Existence was out. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden there was like le legitimately 10 records of this, of this stuff out there. It's like a body of work. A body of work, and it was being recognized in a big way on the internet uh, directly by the fans, you know. Um, when I first got into Candy Rat, I was kind of shocked that there seemed to be this dividing line of old school and what I call progressive, kind of thinking forward, you know, uh, finger style guitar. And, the, and the, the, that dividing line is, is, um, is kind of the, is Chet Atkins and the Nashville sound mm -hmm. and, and uh, what Gareth Pearson would call, who's, a, who's another Candy Red artist, the Nashville Holy Trinity, which is, I think, Chet and... Jerry. Jerry, Breed, and there's one other... Maybe Buster B. Jones Merle, or something. Merle oh, Travis. Merle Travis. Merle Travis. Well, Merle Travis definitely or, even predates all those guys. Merle Travis was a, definitely a okay. mid-century, mid uh, mid-20th century country blues artist. And... Uh, we even still call it Travis picking to this day, uh, what he did. He played with his thumb and his index finger of his right hand exclusively and created rhythmic picking uh, with his right hand. He was kind of the, the, one of the great innovators in the country blues side of things. His son is Tom Bresch. And Tom, it's interesting, I did a workshop with him in Interlochen, Michigan about three or four years ago. And Tom has written a lot of his own music and when he plays his own music, he, he uses thumb and all of his fingers. And when he covers any of his dad's stuff, he goes back to just using his thumb and his first finger. So it'll sound kind of like what, what his father did, mm -hmm. which is a little more rudimentary in terms of technique. But it was the beginnings of really what became modern fingerstyle music. Mm -hmm. Before that, you could look back to, and this is my, my, my historical knowledge of, of the guitar is a little limited. But if you look back at people like Big Bill Brunzi and Mississippi John Hurt and the, the Reverend Gary Davis, those kind of uh, blues artists that came out of the even earlier part of the 20th century, 
and influenced a lot of players in the 50s and 60s. For example, Bruce Coburn always says that, you know, Mississippi John Hurt was probably his biggest influence on the guitar. Uh, Bruce took it somewhere else. He doesn't sound anything like Mississippi John Hurt, but that's who got him started. That's who got him interested. So, um, so Merle Travis, of course, a real landmark uh, historical figure in fingerstyle guitar, along with all of those other players. And yeah, what ends what ends up happening, I think, in my own mind when I think about it, the people who are really rooted in that style, that sort of mid twentieth century country based picking. Um, they are very much in the Chet Atkins kind of school, that world, which begat, of course, people like Tommy Emanuel and, a few, and you know, even I think some of Gareth's stuff, mm -hmm. you know, er, sure. early on was definitely in that style. And uh, people like Shane Hennessy, the Irish mm -hmm. guitarist. And, uh, so the, they're very much rooted in that like mid 20th century style. Whereas somebody like Michael Hedges and myself, I will put myself in this, this box as well, um, we were much more interested in. Uh, sort of avant-garde music of any kind, like it. Uh, for example, my my music uh, education at York University in Toronto was it was the 20th century when I went to university. So it was very 20th century thinking, very forward thinking. It was all about what what can we do that's new, what new uh, horizons can we discover musically. And Michael Hedges went to Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore. Very similar philosophy in mm -hmm. terms of the music education. And his professors knew my professors. You know, Michael was a little bit older than me, but he uh, he had a very similar education. So when we met, we really could talk the same language. We had a lot of the same favorite composers and stuff like that. And ironically, neither Michael nor I was really all that influenced by other guitar players. Right. We were more in, in, you know into Verez or you know Stockhausen or. Uh, Steve Reich, you know, uh, composers that were just kind of doing any kind of instrumentation you can think of. And Michael, I know, was very uncomfortable with the guitar box. And I continue to be uncomfortable in the guitar box. Yet, I understand, too, that people compartmentalize whether I want them to or not. Mm -hmm. So people think of me as a guitarist. And I understand that as a, as a livelihood. I go up on stage, I play the guitar, I sing as well. But... Uh, but I think of myself as a musician, a composer, an arranger, all these things. And there's a whole lot of stuff I can do at home in my studio on keyboards and other instruments and stuff like that. But I can't lug that stuff around. And that's the great thing about the guitar. It's a polyphonic you know, instrument that you can, you can transcribe almost any music for it. You can write almost any kind of style that you want on it. And you can take it with you on a plane you know, or a car. That's, that's kind of awesome. <laughs> As just kind of an aside, the the event we're recording this at just uh, had John Stropes as a as a guest speaker, and he he did he yeah, I think is his first presentation on Michael Hedges publicly, where he had wow. he had gone through 150 hours of video and all this stuff. One of the stories he he said is when Michael Hedges went to Peabody, he went as a classical guitar major mm -hmm. after the first year, and they after the first year they pretty much told him. Unless he really upped his game, he he would wouldn't be you know wouldn't be allowed to continue the program. Right, and so he switched to composition mm -hmm. at Peabody. He's also and that's really, he's also a flute player. And, and yeah, and, and, and that, I mean, his history, his father was really big into composition or mm -hmm. whatever. So, yeah, um, it was just it was an amazing presentation about. Uh, Hedges and his history, it was really cool. It's another interesting parallel, because when I went to York University myself, um, they basically offered, if you were going to do guitar performance, the only two streams there really were were classical or jazz. And I did not fit at all, it, it, neatly in either box. I, I had very little classical repertoire. I could read music OK, but it just wasn't turning my crank to play that way. I didn't play nylon string guitar. And I was not playing, you know, giant steps and improvising and doing Coltrane tunes and stuff like that. That wasn't really my thing either, although I appreciated it. I appreciated both edges of what they were offering very much as a listener. But I didn't see myself really uh, excelling at either of those. I thought of myself as just a contemporary musician, and guitar was my first instrument. But um, So I ended up, yeah, focusing on composition, harmony, theory, electronic music, uh, recording that kind of stuff and it, all of it came in super handy and mm -hmm. so it's interesting our 
the parallel lines of Michael's evolution as a musician and mine are kind of staggering. And I didn't mm -hmm. realize until we got to know each other. And it was just like, really? You did that too? Oh yeah. my God, you know? So uh, kind of the next period in Candy Rat I think about is starts in around 2009 and probably ends in around 2014 or 15. And that is um, it, 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 because of that first explosion on YouTube and like a quarter of a billion views and it was like, it, it, got, it got the style of finger style guitar out there to a lot of, a lot of people and, and it turns out a lot of young people uh, yeah. in high school. Mm -hmm. And they saw what Don was doing and Andy was doing and, and Antoine was doing and you know, a lot of people want to go into the music business and be artists and they said, you know, that looks like a path that makes sense to me. And so between 2009 and 2000, let's say 14, 15, Candy Rat was getting about three to five submissions a day. And it, and it was crazy. It was, it was nonstop. And we were, I mean, we put out a lot of records during that, that period and yeah. signed a lot of new artists. Yeah. And I kind of feel like that's the second generation of players that were, and they were influenced by the first. And it's usually, it's usually like a four or five period. It's almost like ties to high school, you know, like four years in high school. And so that second period, we, um, we, it was a lot of activity and, and uh, things were going well. You know, there were, there were not the explosions that Andy had with drifting. No. That's a once in a lifetime thing. Yeah. That's, a one, that's a very rare thing to happen. Mm -hmm. But we did have some, some people with uh, smaller successful bubbles. Um, and that would have would have been like uh, Stefano. Well, Stefano Baroni, you know, was kind of at the end of that first period, uh, and and some other Candy Red artists. But we we signed a lot of new artists, and the amount of submissions came, that came in during that period was unbelievable. I mean, it was it was probably five thousand submissions. Oh my God! To this little label that's yeah. run by you know at this point it was it was me and my wife and my that's dad right. was doing a you know the the yearly accounting yeah i mean that's it and the revenue really and the, even from this explosions the, the sales of selling recorded music even with this explosion pre music streaming which I, i'm sure i'll talk about at some oh, yeah. point um what i found out with the itunes model which is a digital record for ten dollars which i thought was a fair thing mm -hmm is what I, what I found out as a record label is that the vast majority of, of, of music consumed, you know, number one occurs between 12 year olds and 24 year olds. They consume more music times 10 mm -hmm. than you know, like adults. Yeah. And, and they find all their, you know, they, you, they kind of set their musical preference, uh, preferences a lot during that that phase. Yeah, a lot of people say whatever you were listening to when you were 18 is their favorite music for the rest of your life. You know, I, I feel like that's true. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've seen that as a label. Um, so, so, so that happened, and at, at the same time, those people about it was this generation that didn't started to think that music shouldn't cost money. Right. And so, even though you know it was ten dollars for a digital CD, a, a record. You could you could with within like thirty seconds get on Google and find a link to download that record for free on a torrent or something on a torrent. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of young people that were consuming that new music weren't weren't actually paying for it. And there mm -hmm. was this you know this ten year period between probably maybe it's fifteen Napster and music streaming mm -hmm. where there was there was a lot of young people that kind of said art should be free and music should be free and you know they justified theft. Well, there was a lot of rationalization going on all over the place. I mean, I remember when, when Napster first hit, uh, people were saying, well, record companies are evil. Well, what proof do you have of that? I mean, there are stories, of course, that you can find, like the Dick James story with the Beatles or whatever. There's all kinds of stories of artists getting screwed over by bad contracts. But the vast majority of us had a fine experience, and it was our only option at the time. I mean, you I mean, you could go indie if you wanted to, but that was a tough row to hoe. It's a lot easier to get signed and then have somebody at least supporting you, like being like patronal, you know, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, yeah, it, it, it was like it was like when people go to war, you know, it's like immediately those people are not human anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's like when people started wanting to uh, take music instead of paying for it, the whole idea that you would be a company that would actually charge for it made you evil. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I heard that all the time, you know, and then I would say people, I would hear people say, I'd rather deal directly with the artist rather than a middleman. Okay, great. Well, then here's my CD. Well, no, it's okay. You know, they, they, I already, they, I already, yeah, they, I already, I already have, have it. Right, right. I already have it. Okay. Well, yeah. How'd you get it? <laughs> so, so there was a lot of rationalization going on, and unfortunately, because it was technically so easy to do, and there were, you know, the Google F- made lots of advertising money yeah, they on, sure until, on telling people where to get it for free. They sure did. And then, you know, there was no FBI officer poking over your shoulder. And the other th- amazing thing to me, and I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this to you the other day or somebody else. The incredible thing to me was that when uh, things like Pirate Bay and Kazaa and all this kind of stuff came along, you know, to sort of take over when after Napster got lost their court case. Uh, out of curiosity, one day because I would never steal music, out of curio- I would never steal anything, but out of curiosity, I looked on the Kazaa website and just to see what what of mine was there. I didn't even get that far because the first thing I saw along the top of the website was a banner ad from Visa, MasterCard, you know, Visa credit cards. I thought, wow, okay, so a money company is buying ad space on a website. Cheap ads. Yeah, on a website that uses content that they stole. Isn't that astounding? So that, that to me, was was the, the big education. And, of course, a lot of people now would say, well, oh, come on, you know, you're stuck in the past. No, I mean, it was, a, it was a justice issue. It would be a justice issue no matter what it's about, right? The fact that I'm a musician is immaterial. If I saw it happening in any other industry, I would say, well, that's not right. Mm-hmm. But, again, people rationalized it like crazy. I'm not doing anything wrong, and everybody else is doing it. Okay, so the second period when we got this flood of submissions, uh, we really didn't have the revenue to hire like lots of people to to grow that business. So we had to be pretty selective. We could, you know, uh, with two employees, we could only support maybe like five new artists a year. And with, you know, uh, 5,000 submissions coming in over a period of time, um, you know, there was a lot of people that kind of like, what else is there, right? Which is, I, I think you had a discussion with Alicia from Fret Monkey, and I feel like they kind of stepped in and filled that need for, for a lot of people and a lot of those submissions that had nowhere to go because exactly. we couldn't, you know, we couldn't help everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, we did have some success with kind of the next generation uh, of artists. Mike Dawes would be one of those. And uh, let's see, Gareth Pearson, Ewan Dobson, and uh, Stefano Barone, Jimmy Wallstein was mm-hmm. the second, um, you know, kind of in that second wave. There are many others like, um, as well. And we were just kind of, you know, going along. It was, it was, it was going. Uh, that's and the, it was still original music, which mm-hmm, is cool, mm-hmm. because most of it was original music. And then something kind of changed about, you know, three or four or five years ago, and uh, covers started to become, you know, started to blow up as viral videos. And mm-hmm. as important as Andy's viral video was, people started to recognize that viral videos can change careers, mm-hmm. and so. Um, Covers became more and more important, and and originals started to you know kind of drop in views, uh, and so the last three or four or three or four years maybe, I, uh, it seems like there's every, every time I go to YouTube, there's another channel of finger st- you know it's a finger style cover channel. I mm-hmm. mean I, I've counted twelve mm. at this point, and uh, I, I feel like you know. Uh, in a few more years, there might be 50 or 100, mm-hmm. you know? So like, it's, it's everything's, what I'm seeing after being in this business for 15 years, which isn't a, a terribly long time, but it's long enough where you can start to see trends, y- trends and bubbles and, and, uh, and uh, you know, when you run a business, you try to you stay ahead of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't always predict what, you know, the, the right way, but the music business, is difficult because it it's it's changed a lot in 15 years. Well, and it's the, changed several times. Yeah, in that's the thing. Years. The floor the floor is always moving under your feet, and that's been my reality as an artist. People say, "What you're still doing it that way?" Well, that's that worked up until about six weeks ago. Now everybody's doing this, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, as a consumer, I guess it's easier enough, easy enough to sort of shift everything and just oh, I'll, I'll migrate to this other thing. 
But as a as somebody who's creating content and trying to make a living, you go, oh my god! Now I have to like replicate all of this and shift it all over there. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, look at MySpace, right? right. <laughs> so there was a time when both Candy Rat and I considered MySpace and a whole lot of other the number one considered it was the it was the way to get the word out. Right. And then as soon you, as YouTube, uh, yeah, it, supplanted that. Yeah, YouTube and finally Facebook just right. completely finished it off to the point where MySpace became the butt of a joke. You know, pretty much. But that. That only took a couple of years from it being vital to have thousands of you know uh, contacts, MySpace, friend, followers, MySpace followers, and followers, and contacts, and plays. To, and yeah, people are always saying, "Yeah, thanks for friending me." I remember that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, and then it was a whole other kettle of fish. YouTube, then it was Facebook, and now it's Instagram. Instagram, and right? What'll it be next year? You know, so it's right. it's it's fair enough. That's just the way it goes. You know, you can't control any of that, but uh, it's. It's adapt or die, you know, that's definitely mm-hmm. been, been the, 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 the model. And that was part three of my conversation with Rob Poland, founder of Candy Rat Records. I spoke to Rob at the Fingersell Collective Festival in Arkansas. And speaking of guitar and guitar playing, if you are looking for a way to get started, or to continue your skills as a guitar player, make sure to check out my website, donrossguitaracademy.com. And what I have up there so far is my beginner series and the beginning of my intermediate series for guitar. So I can take you either right from the very beginning, if you don't know which end of the guitar to blow into, or you can pick it up somewhere in the middle and learn tunes, learn a lot about theory, learn about tunings, learn about slide guitar, all kinds of things. So check it out, donrossguitaracademy.com. All right, I'll get episode four up right away. See you next time on Guitar Case. Thanks for listening. <laughs>